welcome uh, to Suzanne and my talk of what to expect when you're expecting a pen test. Note the pregnant pause. See what I did there? Ha 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 ha. All right. So uh, we've got a lot to talk about, and we want to make sure that we, uh, we get through it. So uh, who are we? You're up, Suzanne. I don't know, Larry. Who are we? <laughs> All right. My name is Suzanne Pereira, and I'm the director of operations at InGuardians. And what that means in a small little nutshell is I'm in charge of all the operations project management. I'm in charge of all the internal project management within our company, logistics, all of that fun stuff. And also working directly with our sales to make a pen test better, to put this presentation together for all of you, whether you are the ones doing the pen test or the ones wanting the pen test. Excellent. And I'm uh, Larry Pesci. I'm the uh, Director of Research and Senior Managing Consultant at InGuardians. Uh, that has a couple of different tasks that I, I'm engaged in, but the TLDR version uh, is that I'm responsible for lots of uh, logistics uh, based on some of our folks uh, going into the field for pen tests, uh, engaging with our customers to make sure that we have everything to be successful uh, on a pen test for both us as, as uh, pen testers uh, and for our customers as uh, recipients of our services. Uh, I also do some logistics around the research side to make sure that uh, projects are uh, on track and that we're actually focusing efforts to something that makes a difference. Uh, and I'm also, despite the fact that I have a director and manager uh, in my title, uh, I'm also an agent in the field and easily spend 50% of my time, if not more, uh, actually doing billable technical work. Uh, so while doing management, I'm also doing web app pen tests and internal network pen tests and hardware hacking and, and you name it. So uh, many hats. All right, so let's, uh, let's start us off and uh, see where we're going. And uh, we were going to make everybody stand up and shake hands because all good introductions start with a handshake. But you know what? It's too early for that. Okay. Say hi to the person next to you. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> and you guys are spread out far enough that handshakes would get weird and, yeah, messy. But uh, so wh why did we put together this talk? Well, if, believe it or not, Larry and I were very young, but we have 20 plus years experience in this penetration test. Yeah, I was doing the math this, on this this morning in the shower, probably should admit that, uh, but it's probably closer to 30, but 20 plus is, is good. I was trying to keep us young. Perfect. Perfect. All right, and with that many years of experiences, we've been able to see all the ways that a, that a pen trust, penetration test can fail, and with that, a couple examples are missed schedules, missed deadlines, whether that's due to the client not being ready or the penetration testers not being ready. We've also seen many things where you don't meet the expectations of either side because they're not well defined. And also the legal documents that can involve. You would not really realize how much legal stuff goes into it, redlining back and forth, so you have to take that into account. Yep. And we've also seen uh, amazing ways in which a penetration test can be uh, incredibly successful. Uh, and not just from us as penetration testers doing our root dance, uh, but providing some real value to the organizations in which we've been contracted to do work. Um, whether that be through uh, completion of all of our goals on the pen tests and providing some additional value through rescoping uh, within the same budget amount. Um, the ability for us to go above and beyond what they actually expected, uh, providing additional value add with things that uh, they didn't expect to find. Uh, and by providing additional things for those customers uh, that can go above and beyond what they expected uh, to give them a better understanding of what their, their risk actually ends up looking like uh, based on all the experience that we've had across so many different verticals. Okay. All right, so what else have we learned? A penetration test is not just about slinging packets or your exploits. Um, we've learned from our side uh, the benefits of it. Let's see what else. That 
from the quote the other side of the house as yeah. us being those that help deliver services for pen tests. You guys, when you contract for a pen test, you have a pretty good idea what goes into it. Yeah, exploits and packets and all sorts of fun craziness, and everybody does their root dance, uh, and then you guys are sad at the end because you got you got owned. Uh, but there's so much more that goes into it that can uh, that can make it be successful. And many of the things that we've seen, we can address as both uh, deliverers and as you as consumers of pen tests uh, to make things uh, so much better. So by working together, we can give you so much more as part of your engagement. Also, because we are in Guardians, we have a clear bias to our ways, but it also doesn't mean that there's not really valuable information that you can take away from this for whatever side you're on and bring it to your company. Yep. <clears throat> when we're talking, this is a fantasy world. So if you could do everything that we list up here ahead of time, then that means your pen test is set up for uh, really great success and for getting the most out of what you want. Yep. If it were to all work out like we described, it would be a Hallmark movie for pen testing. And we love Hallmark. Well, you love Hallmark, right? All right. Okay. So that said, if we're going into that fantasy world, if we can get better every time at doing this, if we can fail forwards and get better, but still have some failure, perfect. So that next time we can continue to fail forward and not backwards. Let's not get worse. Let's get better. Exactly. All right, so what are we going to talk about? We're going to try to hit a bunch of stuff, and we're going to try to move fairly quick, uh, given that we've, we've probably got about 40 minutes at this point. Um, we're going to talk about some things to think about before you even go to bid for a pen test, the pre-RFP stage, uh, knowing what you want and when you want it. We'll talk about uh, what happens after that contract is signed, uh, what things you should expect. And then once we have all the information that's needed on both sides, what actually starts happening? What should you expect for communications and such? Um, when we start sending packets and exploits, what should you expect there? And then at the end of the pen test, what do you do now? Uh, and then sort of wrap that up with some conclusions. All right, all right so let's start with the pre-RFP, so your request for proposal, knowing what you want, when you want it. This is key, and you would be Surprised about how many people, when they actually sign at SOW, had no idea what they bought. Yes, it's frightening. Yeah, we signed, we, we signed a statement of work for a pen test, and we want you to do this. Well, that's not the paperwork that you signed. You signed something completely different. Okay. So thinking about that critically, before you even go into getting some engagement going, to, to issuing an RFP, or reaching out to some folks uh, to, to want to get a pen test of some variety, know what you want and know what you want in your mind and be able to describe it in writing. Uh, we talk about what's a pen test. Well, your idea of what a pen test is may be significantly different than what our idea of a pen test is. Uh, and it, it's an industry standard term, but many folks define that differently. In some cases, a pen test is significantly more like a red team in that there's lots of physical involved. So. Check with your vendors and see how they define it. And then have your definition go into that RFP as to what you expect this engagement to entail. Absolutely. Also, ask to see sample reports. This is very important. When you're planning this, plan for the whole thing. So you want to see what you're going to be left with. And then you'll also see why prices are different. So if you're going to be left with a sample report, or a report at the end, know that you're getting value for what you're paying for. Yep. And go, uh, go review B.B. King's talk yesterday uh, on reporting and take that advice and compare that to those sample reports that you get. So ama amazing advice from B.B. yesterday. All right, some other stuff. Know exactly what you want tested. You know how many times we go into a, 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 a kickoff call with a customer and they sign a statement of work that they want an external pen test and they have no idea what they actually wanted tested. Do they want a, a web app pen test? Do they want an external network pen test? They don't even know how many IP addresses should be in scope. Like They made a guess for their RFP, but then when it comes down to it, it's significantly more or less. Do oh. the inventory upfront of what the hardware is, what the you know, operating systems are, uh, all the fully qualified domain names for all the websites that are potentially in scope. If you're doing phishing, what are the email addresses that you're potentially going to want to target? And remove the ones that you don't want targeted. So it's amazing how much work you can do upfront to, to make some of this a success. 
Also, ask your stakeholders. Ask the people actually there working. A lot of times you have a technical buyer or someone that puts your RFP together, but they don't really know what your, the concerns are within your organization. Get those people involved so you get a test that you want. And doing this up front, you know you need a pen test. You have money in the budget for a pen test, and next thing you know, it's Q4. Have you ever tried to schedule a pen test Q4? For 2019. Yeah. So has everyone else. <laughs> yes, Q4 is arguably our busiest season, and uh, also Q3 because those organizations that have their, uh, their end of year end in October, uh, that they want everything done by October or uh, December so they can get it in their current budget year. Um, get all this information in January. If your budget is approved in January, you know you're going to have the pen test. Figure out what you want early so that when you finally get to Q3 or Q4, you're ready to go and you can have significantly better success and without delays. The other thing is great pen test companies fill up fast. So if you want a pen test in a week or two, you're not going to go with the great company unless, unless they happen to have an opening, and that's rare. All right, again, some more on the RFP advice. Uh, don't use the buzzwords, and if you do, make sure you define them. Describe what you want, because our definition of what that buzzword is may be significantly different than what you expect that it is. And we want to make sure that we give you what you want, and that when we see that language in an RFP or that discussion, uh, that we can tailor what our documents and what the scope for, for the testers is actually supposed to be. And also, if you're a vendor, if you're the vendors that actually are doing the penetration test, talk to your sales team about this too. Let them know that sometimes the client doesn't know what they're saying, so get a description of it so that internally you guys know what it's called. You can call it whatever they want. Yep, exactly. So some other things to think about. Why are you actually engaging someone to do a pen test or have some sort of uh, testing activity in your environment? Uh, Stating this up front to the folks that uh, you're looking to work with gives them a better frame of reference for how they may want to consider scoping it, uh, how that will eventually affect cost, what the report should look like, some things that we think about going into the engagement to make sure that we're capturing all of the risk points uh, for you. Is it something that's uh, you know audit or compliance driven? Uh, did you have an incident and you're now going back and doing some additional due diligence? Uh, or is it just an overall commitment to security? Uh, all of those things will, will help upfront um, to, to give you a better test communicating those with your vendors. All right, so some more, uh, again, back to that whole inventory. Accurately describe the environment and its technical components. Also, evaluate your resources and when they're going to be available. Know ahead of time if you have blackout dates, because you can't schedule during that. Also know if you have specific times of the day that you're allowed to test or you're not allowed to test, because many times we have companies that know that hackers don't test during business hours, so they make us test at night. Know that up front. If your company is going to do that, that's better known up front and out there instead of the day of the test. Yes, because if you think about uh, some of your testers uh, and you go through the whole process, you, you have a signed contract and uh, the, the day comes to start uh, actually doing the testing and, and you tell your vendor uh, who's doing the pen test, hey, by the way, we can't start testing until 5 p.m. Eastern, uh, non-business hours. A and at that point, those folks that are engaged in doing that testing have been up since 6 a.m. getting their kids on the bus and now have been ready to work all day and well now they have to work all night too that that stinks and sometimes you have to swap out resources to make that happen uh, because you've drastically changed the schedule know that up front when and at what times you can do that and don't assume you know that please ask your company because yes. sometimes you would assume you can do it during business hours and the the higher ups come down and say, no, we don't want anything going on during our normal hours. This is, this is again, why having some of the stakeholders for uh, these systems that are both asking for the test and having their systems tested uh, involved up front is really important. Okay. Some other things, which environment are you going to test? Are you going to test your development environment? Are you going to test your test environment? Uh, and how closely do they relate to your production environment? Are you going to test your production environment? And then what happens when something goes wrong in your production environment? Yes, not, not a good time. All right, the fun stuff. Paperwork, paperwork, paperwork. Expect to sign a mutual NDA. If you don't get offered this or asked about it, 
be concerned because you're sharing valuable information with maybe multiple vendors. They should want to keep that confidential. You should want to keep it confidential. And this is very much, it's a mutual NDA, it's a two-way street. You're offering potential information to someone that's going to come a pen test you. You don't want them to give that information away to anyone. Uh, the pen test companies uh, may also want to uh, give you some very descriptive methodology so that you know what we're going to do. What, what value do we provide to you? And those folks may consider that intellectual property and don't want you to share that with, with anyone. With the, the value of the, the mutual NDA, so not only if you're contracting with, with us, we're not going to tell folks what your problems are, what your uh, resource problems are, what your IP addresses are, you name it. We're also not going to tell anybody that you actually even approached us that you're looking for a pen test. For whatever reason, whether that be you had a previous incident or you're just taking a commitment to security, we cannot tell anyone that you guys came to us and are looking for a pen test, even if you don't contract with us. I think that's pretty valuable. So some more paperwork, uh, the mutual NDAs, the statements of work, contracts, get out of jail free cards. Those are if you have physical assessments, your MSAs, your third party authorizations. See the list, it goes on and on. We have rules of engagement, liability release. The more you know about what paperwork you actually need, the better off you're going to be once the engagement actually starts. And it is very likely that your legal team will want to review every one of these documents and has issue with some of the language in these documents, whether provided by uh, the pen test firm to you or using your firm's documentation. Likely we may have some issue with some of that language. So there's going to be an opportunity for some back and forth about making some changes to those documents. And that's going to take time. And unfortunately, uh, sometimes the legal folks, they get lots of things to do. And the documents may not come back uh, in, in a fashion that you'd expect them for speed. And if you're expecting your pen test to kick off in a week, but it takes three weeks for your legal team to review the, the changes uh, for a documentation, that, that math doesn't add up. So three weeks of legal review to start a pen test in a week, uh, something's going to push. So again, knowing a lot of this information up front is incredibly helpful. Also important, know who is on the team and what who's on the team and what they're asking for for the penetration test. And with those stakeholders for the penetration test, include the folks that are having their systems tested. They have all of the institutional knowledge about what's there, what the potential problems are, and what they need to do to have some of the, the stuff tested from, from an access perspective, or, or what components are in the system. So having that uh, up front is good. And also, having all of those people there, you get a much better understanding of actually what they want tested and, and why. And that goes back to some of our uh, additional uh, motivation. And then you can also have those folks, the owners of those systems now may have to do something when their systems get owned. Now's a good time to some, set some commitments as to what they're gonna do for some remediation and what sort of timelines that may potentially look like. Also decide then if you want a white box or a black box and how much information you want to give. Again, this is better set ahead of time instead of on the kickoff call and then having an argument internally on the call. If you know this stuff ahead of time, it will set you up better. Plus, you can, you can factor that into your budget if it's going to be white, or white box or black box. Black box will take significantly longer time to complete, given that, well, now you've got to go figure out all that information from the, from the pen tester side, which eats into potentially engagement time for actually making, quote, pen test magic happen. Okay. Um, some other things. Do you want to whitelist your, your testers? What's the point of your engagement? Are you looking to determine what your detection capabilities are uh, from when a pen test happens? Or are you looking to find the problems in your environment to fix? And, and these are both valuable. Uh, be uh, willing to be flexible for some of that whitelisting. Are you testing detection capabilities? Great, we can detect you. Great, now whitelist us and tell us how we should proceed so that we can find all the other issues in your organization to provide you the ability to address those risks uh, so that you can get to the root cause of some of the, the problems. So thinking about a hybrid approach there may also be quite good. Other things you want to decide and consider is do you want them to come on site? 
Do you want, depending on what kind of assessment is, do you want them to come on site? Sometimes that costs more, but sometimes it, add, it adds more value to your, to your organization to actually work with your pen testers. Do you want us to VPN, VPN in? Or do you want to do a Dropbox? Also, we, you could come in from a fish where you just click on a link. Knowing all that stuff up front, and even if you don't know that stuff, knowing to ask the vendor about ideas to best suit what you're looking for. Right. And some other things to think about, given any one of these scenarios, how you're going to get the testers access, how long will it take you to get it configured? from your organization as the recipient of a pen test, and how long will it take to get it tested? And if it doesn't work, are the people readily available to help troubleshoot? There have been many times where we've had pen tests delayed, where we are using the customer-provided IPsec VPN, and it has taken three weeks to troubleshoot username and passwords. Like Something simple takes three weeks. Why? Because the VPN guy is on vacation or the VPN guy is busy on a project and can't be pulled away. So, so many times something like that happens. We drop a Dropbox in the environment and it can't connect outbound because the firewall guy misconfigured the rules and now uh, he doesn't know how to fix it and he has to call the firewall vendor, so. Other so. things to consider is can your operation support the scenario and the requested time? Larry just touched on that. Yep. So uh, are your folks capable of making those changes? Do you know who the right people are to make those changes? Uh, and are they available to make those changes? Also, if you have people on site, find them a space. Find them a, uh, whether it be a conference room or an empty office. Give them that space for the allotted time that they're there the whole week. Because the more you make them change places, the less quality of a test you're going to get because they're constantly having to unplug and replug and switch locations. Yep. So consider those little little logistics. Yep. It's, it's amazing how many times we've had to change conference room in the middle of a test. Sometimes you're in a conference room for four hours on Monday and then you're in a different conference room for the remainder of the day on that Monday and then you're in three different conference rooms given any given week and every time you're having to shift locations when you're doing the testing is potentially a nightmare. Uh, some other uh, things to think about, you know, depending on how you're getting access, does the VPN terminate in the appropriate segment? Do you need to do something, something else there? Uh, if you're doing a Dropbox, can it connect outbound by default? I really hope it doesn't because you're doing really good egress filtering. Uh, can you fix those egress filtering rules uh, easily? And then how long will any of these changes uh, or uh, implementations for the pen test take uh, think, think about that going into that, that, oh yeah, we're going to need a week to change firewall rules because we have to go through uh, our change control process and, and all the documentation and approvals. Uh, sometimes that just can't happen overnight. And as you can see, we have a theme here. Things take time, and before you even get to the fun stuff, you have to deal with all of this ahead of time to do what you like yep. to do. And test it to make sure it's working. Yes. Okay. All right, so you got to con sign contract. Now what? Well, first of all, this is... an where your sales should be coming out and your operations should be taking hold of your contract and you'll be working one-on-one -on -one with them. All right. Again, we've talked about some preparation up front and having all of that stuff prepared as part of your RFP process will really give you success after the contract is signed because you allegedly have all of the information that you need for your testers to pretty much begin right away. Um, Make sure that the dates are going to be supported. You, you should know when some of the teams and some of the stakeholders are available for having that testing because you've asked those questions up front. This is also valuable to the folks that are now going to be delivering those types of tests because now we can get that worked into the schedule for which testers are going to be engaged and that you don't end up with some, some other, uh, other problems. Also verify with your vendor on the actual schedule. Because so many times it may shift or you might have a different idea of what the schedule is. Make sure you're both at the beginning on the same page of when it starts, when it's scheduled to finish, when you're supposed to receive that deliverable. So set those expectations from the start. And if you're doing something like IPsec VPNs or having conference rooms and you know what expected dates are, get that stuff configured as opposed to waiting until the, the conference call uh, to, to start kicking off the engagement. Like, oh, you're starting on Monday, it's Friday, we need to create VPN accounts? Oh, crap. No, you knew this was coming. You could have had those VPN accounts created two weeks ago. The other thing you get stuck on are purchase orders. Just make sure those are in place or the right people 
are in the know to get that moving so that doesn't delay your testing. Because one of your stakeholders is working with the purchasing department, right? Yes, yes. All right, so some, we're gonna talk about some other information before testing as well, okay. All right, so from our side as deliverers of pen tests, if much of this stuff isn't delivered by the time the scheduled date happen, is ready to go for us to start testing, if we don't have access to the environment, if we don't have all the documentation signed, if there isn't a conference room available, guess what can't start? The slinging of packets and exploits and all of the fun pen test magic. Uh, this is where the schedule really uh, becomes time crunch by having all of that stuff done up front because we can't start until we have access to the environment, have all the paperwork signed. So if something happens and those uh, resources are not available, the time frame will push. If we don't have authorization to test signed on the day we start testing, guess what we can't test? Anything. So then we have to change the schedule. Maybe we have to push the testing window out a week and then those resources that we assigned as a deliverer of a pen test uh, may not be available. They're already assigned to another engagement. And then, then you guys feel like, well, you told us Larry was going to be working on that pen test, but we shifted forward a week, and now Larry's not working on it. So you guys did a bait and switch on us. Yeah, it's not our intent. It's just that now the schedule has changed, and Larry's not available. Larry's on vacation next week, and we're not going to ask him to cancel his vacation uh, because some piece of information got missed that if we were informed about it, it could have been uh, addressed up front. All right, again, outside of the stake stakeholders, who else will be informed? If you're doing a red team, a lot of times that circle is really small. Know who those people are gonna be and let your vendor know and make sure that in a kickoff summary or, or whatever gets pushed to you that it's listed there so it doesn't get out to the rest of your team that you don't want to know. We've had more than one. We've had lots of tests stopped. It was purchased. The contract was signed. It was scheduled. It was ready to start slinging packets. And the, the purchasing uh, person at the organization, the technical buyer, uh, said to their, their boss, said, oh, yeah, hey, we're starting the pen test on Monday. And I'm like, what do you mean the pen test is starting on Monday? You can't do that. We're doing this major go live, and this is going to interfere. Oh, you mean we should have told you about that beforehand? Yeah. Yeah, so we've definitely seen some internal communication problems because of lack of visibility when stuff was going to happen. Some other ones when we think about going into fishing or whaling, whether it be for just a fishing engagement or a part of a red team, um, we're going to ask for you to approve our pretext. And we were talking about this uh, last night uh, with some folks that in many cases that pretext that we develop is too good. Yeah, I hate it when, they, when, when people say that. Your, pre, your pretext is too good. Your phishing attack is too good. Well, why is it too good? Well, in fact, we're actually sending that email tomorrow almost exactly the way you have worded it. So we're actually doing that real thing. And we don't want any confusion between, between that. This is the, I'm doing a phishing engagement next week, and that's exactly what happened. Oh, by the way, we're actually sending that email next week. You can't use that. You can't use that, yeah. Um, some other ones too is know who can approve the pretext. We have definitely gone through and developed these amazing pretexts for these emails and our technical buyer says, yeah, those are great. And they get sent in and human resources throws a conniption because we were targeting some human resources pretext. And human resources like, oh my God, why are we getting all these phone calls? And yeah, let the folks in the know that this might affect, uh, happen to that. Some other things to think about, if the pretext is too good, how many times are you going to get it revised? Because every time a revision happens, that's more time that could potentially delay the start of some of that. Okay. Some other things is, will the help desk know that a phishing engagement has just happened? And will they keep mum about it? Right? it oh, they were, somebody reports this unusual email to the help desk, and then, oh my god, the flags go up and say, oh yeah, no, maybe the help just tells the, the person, great, you can delete that and we'll begin looking into it. We've heard a couple of other reports and we'll see, we're, gonna, we're keeping an eye on it. Or are they just going to raise the red flag and send an email to all the users of the organization? Don't click on that! Yeah. What's the intended response? And knowing some of that up front is helpful. All right, communication, communication, communication. This is a big thing that I push at our company. But be prepared to have a call with your penetration um, testing firm. Don't shy away from it. Make sure you're on the phone with them, you're all set, and you're ready to go. It, 
the kickoff call, have all your stakeholders on there that want to know about the test. That way all the questions get answered at once. You can make sure your checklists are all done and you're all set to go. And everyone gets a chance to ask questions. What does this mean? The technical folks that are the Windows Server admins that are having their services tested, they get to ask questions. Perfect. Okay. Uh, this call may actually seem repetitive because you're likely going over some of the same documentation that you've seen floating around with the statement of works and, and scope and you name it. Well, this is a time to ask questions, make sure that everything is as you expect it, and sometimes the paper doesn't come across with the right inflection, um, but the, the call does, even though it may seem repetitive. So some more things on that, uh, the calls before you do some of those kickoff. Um, you know, again, reconfirming what you're actually looking for. Well, we put this on paper and we had this discussion about what your definitions are. Let's confirm and what's the expected outcome. Okay. Take a look at the statement of work that was signed and make sure that the folks that are getting the test actually know what they're getting. Also, as a tester, make sure you read the statement of work <laughs> and the sales notes and be prepared for that call. To, that also helps with uh, scope creep. You'll know the answers if you read what you're doing and you don't assume it's just like everything else. Yeah. And again, also opportunities to reconfirm all of the things that you've been talking about. What was the expected scope? Oh, no, we found three more IP addresses. Oh, no, those IP addresses aren't owned by us. Um, yeah, we expect these type of results based on audit compliance, you name it. Um, we figured out that uh, between the, assignment, uh, the signing of the statement of work and our kickoff call uh, that our VPN access isn't going to work. Can you guys ship us a Dropbox instead? all opportunities for us to still have some success by doing some communication, by, by changing things and knowing that before the test actually starts as opposed to the day the test starts. Okay. And overall, set expectations. That way both of you can win on both sides because you're meeting what you decided together to meet for that test. Yep. And one of those, uh, those great things for uh, setting expectations is some more of the communications. How often do you expect communications from, uh, from the team that's uh, doing the pen test stuff? Okay. Some other things, uh, more communication. Um, can your team support the access methods? Maybe you have to change that midstream. Um, confirm where the testing will be conducted. Uh, physical location if the folks are going on site. Uh, and is it multiple? That's good to know up front as to whether or not maybe we have to travel between buildings. Okay. Uh, are there any additional third party approvals? Oh, hey, between the statement of work signing uh, and our actual delivery of test, we found out that this website is hosted at AWS. Oh, okay, great. Well, now we have a couple of days that we can get approval from AWS to do that testing. So any of those third party approvals. Okay. Um, and can we make sure that we test credentials for websites and VPNs and by the time we're done with this call. And who do we follow up with when it doesn't work and can we get it addressed quickly? All right, it's time to get started. Oh my gosh, all that work and we finally can get started. <laughs> yeah, and we're not even slinging packets yet. Okay, so during this call, uh, we're gonna start having some more exchange of information. Um, you have all of the information because you did your up homework up front, right? This is the, the fantasy world, yes. right? Uh, you likely have missed something and that's okay. Fall forward, not backwards. Okay. We'll ask for some follow-ups. We'll note things on the calls that uh, all the information that we've received, who needs to send additional, and uh, when we should expect to receive it, and uh, follow up with that list of expectations. Not only us setting expectations to you as receivers of a pen test, or also expectations from, from you to us. Okay. And some other things that we should be also noting, uh, what do we need to actually uh, exchange in order to have a good pen test? So some of that stuff. Okay. Yes. All, All right. right. So to the testers, the people conducting the test, you want contact lists, which is the immediate contact information for if you have a high or a critical finding, so you can contact them right away. You also want a list of everyone else that they want you to talk to while you're testing so it doesn't get stopped. Technical details, depending on the testing type, 
yep. like Larry had said. Yeah. What are you gonna What are you gonna test? IP ranges, fully qualified domain names, uh, the URLs that are in scope, uh, any API documentation, sample API queries. Um, if there, if phishing is involved, whether part of a phishing engagement or a red team, uh, are you providing the targets? Who do we contact to approve targeted lists? Um, some advice up front from you to us on appropriate pretexts. We don't know that you're launching that human resources uh, campaign for changing of medical insurance, but that's a great pretext that we love to use. Uh, tell us in advance about some of the things that you might like to see for some of those pretexts. Uh, transfer uh, authorization documents if you haven't done so already, and tested VPN and application uh, credentials to enhance success. Okay. And if you did it all prior, this is all easy. They just hand it right over to you. Yep, and or it's already done, and we can check that off on the list and say, yeah, time to move on. Exactly. And some other things from the tester's side, what can we provide to, to you to enhance success? Well, again, contactless. Who do you need to call when something is going wrong? Or more importantly, there's an outage in our environment that may have been caused by the testers, hopefully not, and we need you to stop immediately. Or we've detected this unusual behavior. Is it you? Sometimes it's not. We want you to stop until we can figure this out. And we're also going to let you know where our attacks come from. Yeah, not so that you guys can have an extra focus on finding those attacks. No, so when something does happen, you can tell whether it's us or not us. You know, did you detect it? Yeah. Or was it someone uh, you know, from the Netherlands in, in their mom's basement actually a successful exploit against your website? Uh, no, that wasn't us. So deconfliction. Who, who was actually the one that you detected? Was it us or somebody else? Uh, and then finally, uh, an updated uh, and or defined communication schedule. How often are we going to communicate with you on some of our findings? Uh, is it going to be in, quote, near real time? Or uh, is a single call or an email a day appropriate? Or do you just want to sum up at the end of the week? All right. Oops. What did I miss? So all of your research up front, like we said, you will miss something. But this is all meant for you to fail forward. So you're going to go through that list and then see what items we need to collect so the test can get going. Yep. And th things are going to happen. Mistakes are going to get made. We, we understand that. Uh, we forgot a network segment that you know, adding that won't particularly impact the scope or uh, the, the time frame, not a big deal. Uh, and then sometimes th things happen. We're humans. Uh, sometimes there's a family medical emergency and the, the folks that we need to interact with for the test um, have have some other thing that happened in their life that they're no longer available. There has been an occasion where our technical buyer actually became deceased between our kickoff call and the time of start of test. That was concerning. Uh, well, who do we call now and do they still want the test? That one definitely got rescheduled, rescheduled because they had lots of other things that they needed to figure out. Yeah, so uh, things happen a and we can work with those things when they happen and you know, but. Having that communication, like, oh, yeah, you can't start because uh, your technical buyer is no longer here, uh, or he had a death in the family, or she had a death in the family. So things happen. Also on the credentials, when you're a tester, test those a week or two prior. Don't wait till the start date. If, the, if your company put those together and sent them over, do yourself a favor and them a favor and test those right away so you can keep working on them if they don't work. Yep. So if your, your kickoff call is more than a week before the start of the engagement and you tested the credentials that you sent over and then we test the credentials and it, something's different, there's still some time to fix it. And does that Dropbox connect back when it's there? All right. Time to sling some packets. Finally, the fun. Yes. Yes, you will get owned. Okay. It may not be how you expected, and it may not be to the same level of risk that you expect, but you're going to get owned, unless your scope initially was too restrictive. Yes. All right. Larry, great. We have a one single host on our external network in scope, um, and you're going to pen test that one single host, and uh, it's one IP address, and there are no listening ports. Well, why is this machine on the internet, right? So yeah, you won't get owned in a case like that. Or there's one listening port that's not a web server, and it's some service we've never heard of because it's custom built. Scope restrictions uh, will, will result in that. I mean, even in there, you can put your, sometimes they put a, the, the time of the day, but they also make that time of the day like 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. How long will that assessment take if you only have that small window? Think about that stuff when you're putting the restrictions on. 
And, and absolutely, again, it may not, you may not get owned how you expect it, and it may not be to the same level of risk, or it may be worse. In a 40-person company with 300 users in the domain, 255 of them are in the domain admins group. Yikes. I didn't necessarily expect that, but it was an amazing finding and lots of fun. Also, don't take it personally. We're here to help you. As testers, we're <laughs> here to help out the company. So sometimes people get really defensive. It's not aimed at you. It's there to help you, help your company. We're not the bad guys, we swear. We want to help. All right, some more stuff. When the packets and the exploits start sling get slung, expect ongoing communication, especially if there's something exceptionally critical. Uh, or we've met all of our, our goals. Uh, at expected intervals, or more often, if you uh, have agreed on your kickoff call that you're going to have a daily update, or uh, uh, two times a day, if something is found that's critical, expect communication at time of discovery or in darn near real time, and, and have someone that we can reach out to for that. Also, uh, sorry, go ahead. also know there is such a thing as too much communication. And believe me, I'm all about communication, but there is too much communication. When your testers are testing, if you want to be in there knowing everything that they're doing, you're also taking away from the test. They will come to you, they will talk to you, especially if you've set up the daily debriefs or the summaries. But it, the more you're in the know, the more sometimes you have, you have a company or a person that works there that's afraid to look bad, so they need to know everything. Just know that that's too much communication and you're taking away from your pen test. Yep. So some other things for that communication is if there's some, quote, success from the pen tester's side, yes, doing the root dance, and we've met all of our goals, and we have access to systems and other potential network segments, what are some new targets? How can we provide additional value? Uh, what's the next level of risk that you want to evaluate? Um, can we pivot from an external pen test to an internal? Help us decide how to best use our time to what your targets. You weren't scoped for an internal pen test, but after two days, we have access to your internal network. Do you want us to continue testing more stuff on the external, or do you want us to provide more uh, indication of risk that we got inside, and now what can we get from, from there? I mean, we're willing to adjust those types of scope based on feedback from you for that type of communication. Okay. We've clearly got some more communication. Yeah. yeah, more communication. So expect some conversations, like Larry said, about developing targets or post-compromise. And again, to touch base with what Larry said, sometimes when you're in a pen test, you have a field day. It's all high-risk findings, and there's so many of them. What is, you have to ask yourself and go to the client to discuss, if I keep showing you all these high-risk findings, is that going to provide value to the, your company? or changing the way we're doing it, or maybe actually putting more time into the report and giving you more information. Figure out what's best for your company, what provides more value. Yep. And when we're communicating on both ways, you should expect timely responses. Sending in a query about, hey, we've met our flags, we've met our goals of the, the test, and we want to do something else. Uh, we want to help you provide more risk, and we've got three days remaining on our engagement. And if it takes you three days to get back to us about you know, refocusing efforts, the time has expired. You know, now we're on to the next gig. So timely responses is key on both sides. Expect timely responses from your testers as well. All right, so it's over. You got and owned. Yes, the assessment part is over. What, what's now? Well, the big one. A clear, concise, actionable report. This report is the lasting legacy as us, as, as a pen tester. We want to know what your organization is about, what your risk is, what the perceived risk of what we just did, so that we can give you actionable advice. We don't want to tell you to change all your passwords every 30 days when you're using two-factor and all this type of stuff. We want to understand what the environment is so that we can give you actionable results and actionable changes based on, on what we found. Also expect, as the person purchasing the test, that you're allowed, uh, your tester is going to come to you and maybe ask for reclarification on items. That way they can tailor the report to you. Exactly. So, hey, we, we compromised these things, uh, and uh, we found this particular risk, and we're going to advise that you do this. 
Uh, does this make sense from your organization? This is how we understand it, but is it in fact different based on, on, on what you perceive in your organization? And maybe there was some details that didn't come across from some of that architecture perspective that you already have components that can address this, they're just not fully implemented. So maybe we change our recommendation based on that. I also expect uh, updates while we're writing the report. A lot of times the pen tester will go dark and not communicate with the client. Make sure that your timeline is still going and that they're still reaching out, letting you know the writing is going on. It went into internal editing. It will be to you by the set date. Keep that communication and know that it's expected from them. Yep, absolutely. All right, so to reiterate, the report is incredibly important. When we leave as testers, you have a document. And that document may be the thing that your organization from an IT security perspective, that's what they live and breathe for the next year to two years because they've got lots of work to do based on, on the, the risk and the findings and, and you name it. So having a really good report is amazing to work from. And expect to be able to call the testing team up in some fashion to say, hey, want some, a little bit of clarification on this thing, you know, six months down the road. And, and certainly good folks would be willing to do this. The big one is, is that if you want a good report and something that is, has great advice and is actionable, you're going to pay for it. Uh, I, as BB King said and, and others, if you're getting a Nessus output, that is not a report. That's output from a scan tool and may not necessarily be actionable. Uh, I did work with one of our customers that uh, said, Larry, you need to help us come in and result, help us guide the uh, resolution of all of the items. Uh, because our board has said, everything in this report we need to remediate. And there were 350,000 findings in this organization because they were delivered their pen test report, which was output from Nessus, including all of the informational findings. And the board said, you will resolve every one of these. I spent six months helping them figure out which ones they actually needed to remediate and which ones they could immediately risk accept. It was a great contract because I just got to read documentation for six months. And this is where your research up front and asking for those reports are going to prove valuable because when they leave, you know what that report is supposed to look like. Excellent. All right, and finally, uh, after the report, you get the report, expect to have a conversation with the testers and all of the stakeholders and all of the folks involved from both sides so that you can review the report with the team, ask any additional questions, uh, maybe ask for some revisions to the document for either more clarity, uh, but don't expect to say, yeah, no, we don't agree that that's a finding uh, and you should remove this from the report. Yeah, no, if we hacked it, it's a finding. Don't expect us to say, yeah, no, we didn't hack that when we clearly did and we have proof because you know, that reflects badly on us as an organization uh, from, uh, uh, and then legal liability should something ever happen and they say, well, in Guardians or some other firm did the test and uh, they didn't find that. Well, yeah, actually we did, but you had us remove it from the report. So uh, don't expect some of that type of stuff. Okay. So uh, coming up on the end, uh, the conclusions, this is the part where you can stop thinking, right? Hey, so thinking about some of the things that you need for success. Just remember to set those expectations and set them early. That way you all get to the goal of what you're wanting. Um, be flexible and communicate a lot. Right. And so much of the work that goes into delivering a pen test isn't the slinging of packets and exploits and, and all the technical work. There's lots of work to be done up front. And start preparing that early. Uh, you're not ready for a pen test in six months? Well, great. We can now have plenty of time to get all of the folks involved, let them know it's coming, uh, figure out all of the technical details, ask some additional questions of all of our vendors, and, and do a lot of the work up front. All right, and uh, that's about it for us. Uh, but we did want to mention, uh, we do have a weekly executive briefing email um, intended for C-level folks just to, on a Monday to, to give them some uh, ideas about what to think about in their organization uh, with some, uh, some technical details uh, as well as some options for uh, things to think about in your environment to do detection and or remediation. So uh, that's it in guardians.com forward slash briefing. And uh, we only send it once a week and no spam. Uh, st stuff that you can use and is actionable. So uh, thank you very much and uh, some contact information and we'll be around for the rest of the weekend if you have any other questions. So thank you, guys. Thank you very much.